But what if that never happens again? What if every yeah. single time you get paged, it's a new problem? Hey team, Sid here, and this is DevOps Deployed, the show where we take a look at DevOps and cloud infrastructure in the wild. Each week, I interview industry experts about their experience building software systems and the teams behind them. Today, I'm joined by Charity Majors, co-founder and CTO of Honeycomb.io. Prior to founding Honeycomb, Charity worked at Parse and Facebook. She also literally wrote the book on database reliability engineering. You can find her at the handle Mipsy Tipsy on Twitter, which legend has it originated as her in-game character name in EverQuest. Charity, <laughs> welcome to the show. It's true. It was my EverQuest monk. <laughs> Thank you for having me. <laughs> yeah, thanks for joining. So before we dive in on the specifics of Honeycomb, I like to start each show with the same question. What does the term DevOps mean to you? It means if you really want to get people at a bar in San Francisco upset and yelling, just like innocently throw that question out or just use it in a gratuitously wrong way. Just like, so my DevOps team the other day, ah, the beer will start flying and, and everybody gets very upset and, it's, and it can be super fun if, you, if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> I was definitely one of the early coterie who got super invested in terms and everything. And it's like, it's a process, it's gonna roll, blah, blah, blah. There are some battles that are just not worth fighting. <laughs> I, I guess at some point I just came to it and I go, okay, so there's a DevOps team now, it's fine. <laughs> but, but I do think that like there's a larger transformation that we often use DevOps to represent. And when I think about what that means, like the first wave of it was very much about lecturing the ops teams like you need to learn to write code it's not okay to just run systems anymore you need to learn to write them you our systems are getting so co complicated now you have no hope of running them well if you can't do, you don't have to be the world's best coder but it has to be on the menu and i feel like in the past let's say four or five years it has kind of started to swing really hard in the other direction now it's like okay software engineers it's your turn you know it's it's time to learn it's not okay to just write code and go the test pass Yoo-hoo, I'm off to the races, you know? No, you have to, it, it's, your job is not done until you've watched users interact with it in production, which is where all the, you know, testing and production means, you know, and the software engineers must be on call. Like we've seen a huge shift over the past five years. And it's not that I, I don't think that the jobs are, are all converging. It's not that we're all going to be exactly the same, you know, species, because there's just too much. You can't be an expert in everything. But I think there is a sense of just like, it's no longer okay to sit in your corner. You have to know the user impact is what matters. And if you can't trace that back all the way to the job that you do, like you're missing the bus somehow. We're going to dive in on how DevOps manifests at your company. Before we do that, can you tell us about Honeycomb, what it is, who your users are, uh, and a little bit of history there? Totally. It was born out of rage. <laughs> I've made kind of a career out of being the first infrastructure person who joins a company and, and helps them kind of grow up, you know? And I did this at Parse. We were a mobile backend as a service where if you're a developer, you want to write a mobile app, you just use Parse APIs and we do everything magically on the backend. Of course, there's no magic. That means we're doing all the operations on the backend for you. And, you know, we, we took off hockey stick growth and, you know, pretty quickly started to realize you can't predict where the next outage is going to come from. You know, some, some app's going to hit the iTunes top 10. You don't get any warning, you know, and, and it may not even be in your top 10 list on your servers mm -hmm. uh, in terms of traffic or anything, but it can still, it can still take you down. It can still saturate your write lock. You know, we had a fixed pool of, of HTTP workers. If any database or any storage engine or any third party API gets slow, well, that pool fix, fills up within seconds and takes everyone down, not just that app, but like everyone down. And I, I tore my hair out. Like we tried every tool, like every APM, monitoring, logging, you know, they're all like, we fix your problems and surprise, they don't. Um, like the first glimmer of light that I, I got was when we were at Facebook and we started feeding some data sets in this tool they had called Scuba, which is aggressively ugly, like butt ugly, like hostile to users, not fun to use. But it let you do one thing well, which was slice and dice on high cardinality dimensions in basically in real time. And suddenly, like, well, suddenly it took months, but like after we really built the tooling around and stuff, the amount of time it took us to pinpoint where the problem was coming from just dropped like a rock. Like it wasn't even, you know, it used to be hours, days, oh, maybe. So often it would just recover and we'd all look at each other guiltily and go on with our lives. Like we just didn't know what it was and we had no hope. But like our ability to just like target and pinpoint it was it was seconds, not even minutes, and it was predictable. Like it wasn't it wasn't even like 
oh, phew, we found it really fast at the time. It was just like following the trail of breadcrumbs to the answer every time. And this just blew my mind. When I was leaving Facebook, I was I did not plan to start a company. I, I really hate the founder industrial complex. I've not I've not been one of those kids who's like, I want to start a company all my life because I, I could have loathed those people. But I was leaving Facebook and you know, some people were offering some money because I had a pedigree, you know, because I worked at Facebook, which is also obnoxious. But I, I suddenly went, you know, there is an I I was so much weaker as an engineer before I had this tooling. Like it's be, it's become my five senses. Like it's it's not just how I bring the site back up. It's it's how I it's how I it's how I know. It's how I know what I need to work on. It's how I validate that what I just wrote is doing what I thought it would do. And and it's how I you know I just I couldn't fathom going back to being without it. So you know Christine and I started this this project, um, fully believing we would fail. I, at the time I was like, it's only like large multi-tenant platforms that are gonna need this, it's a niche product. We don't know how to build a business, so we're definitely gonna fail, but it's fine. We've got money, we'll build the tool, we'll open source it when we fail, and then I won't have to live without it. Like, this is, this is a great plan, right? But over the course of the first year, when we're talking to people and starting to think about how do we position this, because we knew it wasn't monitoring. It, it wasn't reactive, right? It was supposed to be exploratory and, and forward-looking, and it felt unlike anything out there. It was six months in that I Googled the term observability, because I had heard it once or twice before, and, and the definition comes from mechanical engineering, comes from control systems theory, and it's all about, can you understand what's happening inside the system just by looking at it from the outside, right? And I just like got fireworks inside my brain. I was like, oh my God, this is what we're trying to do. Because when you're building these you know, massive multi-tenant systems, you have no idea where the next problem is coming from. You can't, coming from, you can't just build dashboards and pattern match like, oh, this feels like that outage we had last month, you know, which is the entire way that we used to quote unquote debug our systems, which is scar tissue and memory, right? Like it would be really hard to hunt it down the first time, but then we'd make a dashboard, we'd do a postmortem, we'd write it up, we'd document it, and then we could jump straight to the answer next time. Yeah, but what if that never happens again? What if yeah. every single time you get paged, it's a new problem? So we started like really leaning into this term of observability and, and thinking about like, well, okay, so if this is the bar, right? You should be able to ask any question, understand any system state. Well, what proceeds from that? Well, anything that involves indexes or schemas is out, right? Because you need to be able to throw any details in there without any warning and just automatically query on them. Okay, anything that relies on metrics is out because a metric is just a number with a few tags appended. Those can handle high cardinality, right? They've discarded all of the context at right time. So anything that aggregates at right time is clear out. You know, you have to look at read time. So we basically built a system to that spec and, and we called it observability. And I like flying around the world, you know, telling everyone about it, nobody's giving a shit for like three months, three years. And then three years later, we woke up one morning and the entire world was like, but yes, we want observability. We have always wanted observability. <laughs> and by the way, we do observability too. And I'm just like, oh my God. <laughs> so, you know, it started from rage. We keep not failing. And at this point, things are like, this is, <laughs> seems like we probably aren't going to fail anytime soon, which is kind of cool. But, you know, that was very much unplanned for. <laughs> awesome. No, that's that's a great background on the company. And you talk about the this high cardinality for people in the audience who who aren't familiar with observability. What What is that and what can you do with it? Imagine you have a database collection of 100 million users, like all these details about them. Well, the highest possible cardinality will be any unique ID, like social security number, right? Something like first name and last name, high cardinality. Something like gender, pretty low cardinality, presumably. Not, mm -hmm. you know, there are many genders, but you know, it's, it's not gonna be like millions. Um, and like species equals human would be like the lowest of all. And sure. when you're debugging, what kind of information do you care about? You care about high cardinality stuff. You care about unique IDs. You care about span IDs. You care about anything that is very identifying, right? That's the most valuable stuff that, that you want to be able to find. And the, the prior generations of tools just wrote them all off. They're like, nope, that's impossible. <laughs> We're not going to do that. And they just told everybody, you know, you can have like, you know, up to like a cardinality of I think 100 or so, which is why the classic story is you get started with a data dog or, or something like that, and Relic, and, and you assign like a host, host name to be one of your values, right? Because that's valuable, that's identifying, and that super works until you get up to like 100, 150 hosts. Now you've blown out your key space and you're getting angry calls and you're getting like turned down and your queries get slower and slower. And well, now you have to figure out how to 
and the host is so fucking basic. Like if you can't query on host, like, you know, and that's when people encounter the, the cardinal, the cardinality monsters. And so if you think back to that first iteration of the honeycomb product, that minimum viable product that you were building, <laughs> what features were in that core feature set? So I mentioned we never, we didn't really know how to build a company. Like I pissed off so many of our early investors because they were like, what are you doing? It's been like a year. And I'm like, well, we're writing the storage engine. And they're like, what? <laughs> like, you should be out there prototyping, talking to users and getting their feedback. Just throw it in my SQL and, and do the storage engine later. And I'm like, no, because then we'll look and feel exactly like everyone else. Like, this is core to what we're doing. And I now, now I understand what they were talking about. I get their point now. And God, I can't believe that we survived. But but you had to do it this way, right? You had to start with a storage engine from the ground. So like basically the first generation of the product did nothing but that. It let you break down by high cardinality dimensions. And like that was enough for us to, us to get some serious customers, like just a few. There are just a few nerds out there in the world who are searching for monitoring plus high cardinality, but they all found us, <laughs> right? And the team was just like, you know, me and Christine and one other guy part-time who, who like focused on the storage engine and two other developers. Like it was just the five of us. We were the five musketeers for like, you know, two years or so. And then there were another year or so where it was just like, you know, 12 of us. And then, and then we, we thought that we had it. We thought that we knew what we were building for, you know, we thought we were going to do like, you know, a faster, better elk, but then, you know, that didn't feel quite right. Cause we didn't, we don't want people's trash. You know, we realized that a core part of observability is how you gather that information, how you gather that telemetry. So like, you don't want to just like have a lot of, a lot of really sparse rows or just like, you know, all over the place, what you want is, and, and this goes back to like, you know, when we blew up the monolith, it used to be you had the load balancer, the app, and the database, and all that complexity was bound up in the app, right? So if all else failed, you could log in, SSH in, attach GDB, and just step through it painfully until it all crashed, right? <laughs> well, then we blew up the app. So now like it's hopping all over the place. It discards all the context every time it hops. So what you want to do with your instrumentation for observability is gather up the context and pass it along with it. When the request enters the service, you want to instrument an empty event and then pre-populate it with anything you know about the environment, the language internals, the parameters that got passed in, whatever, right? And then you want a you know, basic framework so that engineers could just stash anything else that's useful in. Shopping cart ID, that might be useful. User ID, that might be useful. Just stash it in. And then when the request is ready to exit or error, it just ships it off to Honeycomb as one very arbitrarily wide structured data blob. What this lets you do is you would ask these very complicated questions like there's a spike of errors. Well, what are they? In, in Honeycomb, we have a thing called bubble up. You just draw a little bubble around it. This is what I care about. And then we will like calculate for all dimensions inside and outside of the bubble and then diff them and sort them. So the ones that are different, like bubble up to the top and you'll see, oh, it is only ones going this endpoint for iOS, for this version of the build ID, for this version of the language pack, for this region, for this, you know, and you can just see them there. And it's like magic because, you know, in the battle of days when, when you just had the dashboards that you had created, you would have had to create a specific dashboard for that exact metric every single time, which you would never fucking do. Right. Go right? back and rewrite you, the query. <laughs> exactly. Or you'd have a dashboard that would have like three or four of them and you go, great, I found it. You jump to the answer and go look for evidence that you were right. Right. And you'd miss like the other half dozen things that were included in that tail. The thing that made us find product product market fit was about three and a half years in, and it was a combination of, of two things. It was figuring out the, the collection part of it, the how we collected the data, and making them easy, like we made beelines where you just installed the library and you got all the stuff magically for free, mm -hmm. right? That, and then creating like a sort of APM home landing page, it seemed familiar to people where it has latency, errors, request rate, you know, because otherwise you get popped into this very complex data browser type thing. You're just like, where do I go, right? But when we, when we collected up the data automatically for people and gave them something that looked familiar, um, that's when like sales really started to click and, and things really got going for us. That was about a year and a half ago. And at the time, I should point out, we still had only eight people writing code. <laughs> you mentioned this custom data store as the central piece yeah. of the whole system. Can you talk any more about that and what sure. the process of developing that looked like with that core team early on? Yeah, so there's actually, there's a white paper that came out of Facebook on the scuba, which, you know, it's totally available. People can go read it. And that helped us kind of bootstrap. We're like, okay, this is some of what makes it special, right? Now, it wasn't a, we didn't take it directly from them because it was, it was built a long time ago. At the time they were doing everything in RAM, right? It's really kind of funny because the, the replication is they, 
they shell out from C++ uh, to rsync and then do an rsync from one node to the other. It's like, okay, guys, this was written at, at midnight, <laughs> some <laughs> night under pressure, wasn't it? So it's basically a column restore. And believe me, we did not want to write a storage engine. Like I've spent my entire career telling people, don't write a database. Do not write a database. Whatever you do, don't write a database. And I would like to be very clear that we have not. We've written a storage engine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sticking to it. Nice. Um, so, so it's a column restore. So every single dimension is automatically an index, right? And, and very importantly, like this is one of the reasons we couldn't use anything else out there. It has to have a very flexible ingestion right? There can't be any concept of schemas or, or anything. It just has to, you start throwing in a dimension and it starts using it, right? And and you can coerce it to a different type if you want to. We'll do our best to like guess what type it is on the fly. So like the way the way data gets in is you ship it into, there's a very lightweight API, then it gets dropped immediately into Kafka. So we've got like several hours of Kafka that we can replay and like if, if anything else goes wrong. Then there's like pairs of retriever nodes. All of our services are named after dogs because reasons. A pair of retriever nodes that like, you know, consume and, and that's our storage engine. Interestingly, like about a year later, we, we actually updated this model and it's now almost completely serverless uh, where the queries are run in Lambda jobs and the files are stored in S3. So like it, it immediately gets dumped into, into the retriever nodes, but then it gets aged out to S3 like within, within a matter of hours, which is, we, we really thought that that was going to kill the performance and it didn't, like it shifted the performance profile slightly, but we our target is like for it to be sub-second querying up to like the 95th percentile. So, you know, it's dead fast. And I saw there is a technical blog on the Honeycomb site that describes that shift. So I would, I'll put a link yeah. to that in the notes for people to check so out as well. We, we've given, we gave a talk at Strange Loop 2017. That's all just like, we're like, blah, we'll just tell you everything about what we do because we, we really, you know, we're nerds. We're like, I believe it's execution, not ideas like every mm -hmm. time. So, you know, we, we gave a talk at Strange Loop in 2017 and Ian Wilkes, who's the mastermind of storage is going to be giving a talk at, at um, Strange Loop this year um, that, that includes an update. So it's going to be hella fun. Super cool. And then you mentioned Kafka. What else is in the tech stack uh, and where is this whole thing deployed? I believe it's AWS, but is that correct? AWS. For the most part, we're using, you know, instances because Kubernetes was not really, like I had wavered over it five years ago when I was setting everything up from scratch, but I was like, it's not ready for prime time. And it wasn't. Um, I think it probably is now. I also think that for a lot of people, it's unnecessary complexity. So, you know, we use, auto scaling groups and we use instance types and you know we've got a number of lightweight go services i guess you would say we're doing microservices but we aren't like drinking the kool-aid on that or anything it's just from a practical practical perspective we use golang and we use for the front end stuff we use a lot of react and then probably dog fooding your own product for observability oh, i'm yeah. sure absolutely in fact we have so we have the honeycomb production cluster then we have a um, dog fooding cluster, which is how we, we monitor everything that goes on in the production cluster through our dog fooding one. And then we have a kibble cluster, <laughs> <laughs> which is the dog fooding dog fooding cluster. And, yes. and, and the way we do our deploys is, you know, every time someone merges a, a batch of changes to main, it automatically kicks off, you know, CI CD pipeline runs and, and driven to the artifact and gets auto deployed within, you know, a minute or two to kibble. And if everything looks good, doesn't crash, then within like 30 minutes, I think it gets promoted to dog food and then automatically gets promoted to production. So that topic you just touched on is one that you're particularly passionate about in terms of the time from code merge to it deployment. Is. Do you want it to touch on that at all? Of, it is the bedrock of any high performing team. Yeah, absolutely. I think 15 minutes or bust, man. If you want a high performing team, and most of us do, and I think you can measure that using the door metrics, right? How, how often do you deploy? How long does it take? How often does it fail? How long does it take to recover? I would add, you know, also how often do you get alerted out, uh, outside of hours? You can you can either like spend your t time chasing around all of the many pathologies or you can fix it at the source, which I, I think involves that interval between when you write the code and when it's live in some production capacity, right? Using feature flags is fine, but, but with the point being that, you know, like the very first thing we said when we started talking here was, if you're an engineer, your job isn't done until you've looked at it, until you've watched users use it, right? In in the wild, because it's that really essential feedback loop and, and tuning that feedback loop and getting it tight is I think the job of technical leaders in our industry. And yet we so often get distracted from it and our focus goes all over. But like, it's one of those like cornerstone upstream things that if you don't get this right, 
it's very hard to get anything else right, you know, later on. And if you do get this right, so many things just kind of fall into place and don't become a problem. You know, when that interval gets really long, well, then shit, you know, your dips get bigger and your code review takes longer. And then everyone starts waiting on each other. So they get even bigger and even longer. And then pretty soon, as, as long as you're up to like an hour, then you're almost certainly going to start batching people's d- dips together, right? You're going to mm-hmm. be deploying more than one person changes at a time. And if you're an engineer and you're writing code and you know it's going to be live within 10 minutes, you're probably going to go look at it. But if you're writing engineer, you're writing code, and you know it will probably go live at some point between six hours from now and two days from now, along with two to 25 other people changes, you're not going to go look at it. Like, I can guarantee you, you're not, you're not going to close that feedback loop. And even if you do, how are you going to know if it was your changes or not, right? Like, it severs this whole, like, idea of code ownership, like, for good. You can never get it, get it back. So I think that there's that. There's also the like the decoupling releases from deploy part is super key, right? You know, making it so that you can deploy constantly, but releases can be done separately at during, you know, daytime waking hours by product managers who want to have releases and marketing things and everything. Right? Those those shouldn't go together at all. I'm not like trying to like diminish how difficult it is to go from a a team that has a very long release train process to, to, to making it small. But if you start out that way, where it just automatically deploys your changes like within minutes and you grow up that way, it never gets hard. It always stays easy, right? And so it's the easiest thing in the world to just, if you have a new project, start it out that way. It's it's almost like that myth of like Ale- was it Alexander and his horse Bucephalus, where it was like the myth was that he would lift the horse every day before breakfast and when he was young. And then as the horse grew up, like, by the time he was an adult, he could lift the horse, right? Because he did it every day and it just never got hard, right? Like when you just, when you just start that way, it just, it just, it's the way it is, right? And it's very easy. And then is there anything else about how you operated as a team early on yeah. with this, this small core yeah. crew building out that initial product? Well, one thing I would say is just when, when it was just the, you know, five of us, you know, it's so easy to just all sit in a room together and be a, be a hive mind. And yet we knew from the beginning that we wanted to be a very distributed friendly company. So many people can't afford to live in, you know, San Francisco, New York. It's a competitive advantage. I think when you can compete for talent anywhere, I also just feel like there are so many, in in many of the same ways as, you know, auto deploy your code within 15 minutes just kind of makes a lot of things easy and natural and, and correct. I think that building your company culture in a way that decouples butts and seats from performance just like makes a lot of things really, you know, it makes it so that people can have families and they can take meetings from their kids' soccer practice, you know, that they can have sort of unusual schedules so that people who have different needs can still be included. It makes it so there's a strong culture of documentation. It makes it so that, you know, it makes it so that managers are incentivized to learn how to manage by looking at output and being very output oriented instead of like being like, well, they're here 20 hours a day, they must be doing well, you know, which is a really unhealthy thing for a culture to do. There were a lot of growing pains there as we just kind of like tried to figure out how to shift from that early core crew to like kind of learn new habits and scale that up. It worked pretty well. We were on a glide ramp, I would say. We hired our very first remote VP the week before quarantine last year. So you know, we, all of a sudden, and one thing that we did that really helped was we had quarterly work from home weeks where everybody was barred from going to the office. Like managers, execs, too often they'll kind of exempt themselves and be like, well, yeah, you, you do it, but like, we're going to be in the office, right? But no, everyone had to go and doing it for a week meant that nobody could be like, well, I'm going to save this work, you know, and I'll do it mm-hmm. next week when we're in person. And so it really helped us iron out a lot of those little kinks kind of over time. And I've worked on teams that were mostly in person and had a couple of remote people. And then also where everyone is remote now for the past year. And it's a very different experience. Very different experience. But I also, I don't want to have a company that's fully remote either. I think that there is a different tenor, a different timber to teams that have a home base than ones that are fully 100% remote. It just seems more personal and warmer to me in a way. And so we're really looking forward to the office opening back up. And you mentioned that as one bottleneck as you started to grow and sort of moving from this core in-person team to building a more distributed uh, open culture. Let's talk about other things that happened as you started to hit that product market fit, grow the user base, usage increases. Let's start on the technical side first, maybe, and think about where did the application systems that you had built 
uh, start to stretch their boundaries? You know, it's so it's so funny. I feel so fortunate that we've basically been able to hand wave away the technical stuff. You know, it's it's just engineering. It's just work. You know, like I I, I think that. First of all, I think very, very few startups are fortunate enough to have an ops co-founder. And so like the infrastructure that I spun up five and a half years ago hasn't really had to change that much. You know, like I did it correctly the first time. And so it was elastic in the right ways and it, it was able to grow up with us. And I made reasonable choices. And I think that that's just kind of a blessing that most co most companies start, you know, they have just software engineer founders who of course are banging away in the product. And then they're just kind of like shoving it all out there. And then there's this giant mess when People like me come in for the first time, you know, a, a year and a half in, we're just like, oh my God, you don't even have backups for your database. All right, kids, let's start. That was kind of a, that was kind of a, a blessing that we had, but you know, we certainly, Kafka is a very big part of our infrastructure and we certainly, for a long time, we were able to just kind of throw hardware. P.S. Like anytime you could just throw hardware at a problem for a while, you should do that. <laughs> and we just threw big instances of that for a long time. And then we kind of had to buckle down and go, okay, now we're going to learn to be, do Kafka correctly. You know, there, there have been plenty of uh, scaling. Well, okay, so like the, the one that we're dealing with right now is, you know, we have an SLO product, which it, it computes, you know, how, how many failures you've had and, and then tells you like how quickly you're burning down your SLO budget and stuff. You know, we ran into a place where we realized that like 50% of our read load is coming from our own SLO product, not, not our users. And so we're, we're now like, you know, refactoring that to compute the SLO from the streaming perspective instead of like over the storage uh, stuff. There's, there's been a fair amount of, I think I would say design and, and front end technical debt. And this, this is the one where, you know, I think it's kind of the flip side of most companies have sort of a real come to Jesus moment around operations when they're a couple years in. And I think we had that kind of come to Jesus moment around, around design. Because we'd always known that, you know, we want to build something that's consumer quality. We want to do better than like the last generation of systems tools where it's just like, all right, memorize all your Vim keystrokes, you know, and it's just like for super users. Our, our philosophy is very much that our tools should get out of their way and help them understand their systems. Their systems are hard enough. We shouldn't be piling on. We had a designer or two, but it wasn't, it wasn't really what you know, we were craving, but we weren't funded for it, right? We didn't have product market fit, so it didn't make sense to invest in it. But then when, when we were funded for it, that's when I realized, okay, we have a fair amount of debt here. And we, we ended up, we've, we've hired like a team of six design, great senior designers and, and a design director who are, who are very top notch. And, and they're, they're now going back and, you know, doing the design system stuff and, and, and all this stuff, but it's a pretty major undertaking because that's a fair amount of debt there. You mentioned that the, the original infrastructure you deployed has been doing quite well, but are there any particularly interesting pager duty stories or equivalent uh -huh. uh, that you can share and walk through what happened, how you triaged it and, and how you fixed the, the issue? Oh my goodness. The ones at Honeycomb, like we've been super transparent about that. We write up all of our postmortems and stuff, but they've, mostly been pretty straightforward. I will say that, that the ones that uh, I endured at Parse led directly to my writing the database reliability engineering book. How about that? You know, because like we kind of grew up with MongoDB. We started using it when it was like version one point something, had a single lock per replica set, you know, and, and we had to do all the sharding ourselves. And, and, you know, our users, like, I don't really blame them. You know, yeah, they just had an SDK. And they couldn't necessarily tell that this query that they were constructing was going to do a 5x full table scan, but like I had to deal with what came out the other end, and that was gnarly shit, man. <laughs> you know, it would just be like, okay, everything's down, and you start from there, right? And and before we had Scuba, we would just start bisecting, you know, like, well, let's. What the, what this led to though was us building a very extensive and complex series of like velvet ropes where we could start, you know, rejecting all the requests for a single app, single shard, a single, you know, group of apps, single, you know, all the way down to we could rewrite individual queries in flight without doing a new deploy of code. It was pretty, it was pretty abominable, honestly. It was pretty hor horrifying, but uh, you know, you do what you got to do. <laughs> Let's roll forward to Honeycomb as it stands today and start to compare mm -hmm. and contrast what it looks like, both from a technical perspective as well as a team. How big is the team now? Yeah. Oh boy. Well, the entire company, we're going to probably hit 90 or 100 by the end of the year. I think we're about 70-ish now. And engineering is maybe roughly half of that. No, we're maybe about 30 in engineering. Yeah. 
which is super interesting to me because like when we were at Parse, like when we got acquired, <clears throat> we were, you know, 25 people or, or so, 29 maybe. And there was like one marketing person and one salesperson. And I look back and I'm just like, we weren't building, like we weren't building that team to be a company at all. We were, we were super building that for acquisition. And I was just too dumb to realize it at the time. At Honeycomb, we, we've always been super clear that Christine and I have got scars around acquisition. We do not want to be acquired. Like we would do it if we were offered sufficiently billions of dollars that we couldn't turn it down for our team's sake. I mean, we would do it if we absolutely had to, but we do not want to be acquired. We want to go all the way. So we've really focused on building a, a real business. And, and that's, that's hard. It takes a, you know, the business side of, of tech is, I, I mean, this is my bias because I come from the technical side, but the business side seems much harder to me. <laughs> How is the engineering organization within Honeycomb structured? Uh, and you asked about our DevOps story, which is we don't actually have any ops people. I, I will often say that, you know, my ops team works for Amazon, um, which is a little ironic. And, and I also don't know that it would have been possible if it hadn't had not just myself, but also one of our early engineers, Ben Hartsford, who's been working with me off and on for like 15 years and also has a very strong ops background. So even though he was writing software, you know, we, we've kind of had the ethos and, and the we've known how to make good choices, right? That, that have helped the, the team kind of be able to grow up without having a lot of toil, without needing a lot of ops stuff. Um, but to this day, you know, we've got like, you know, we've got like close to, you know, 25 ish engineers and, and everyone's on call. Um, everyone owns their own code and production. Um, we have teams that are kind of organized. They're not, they're not transient, but you know, so we've got like three teams. There's the platform and then there's the product team. And then there's the you know, integrations team. But we also like spin up little core groups of, you know, a PM and, you know, three engineers to, to work on, you know, we've got a little core of folks that are working on metrics for now, you know, with a designer or two. And then, you know, a bunch of folks who are working on, you know, the, the, um, the, the design system stuff and, and, and those teams will, we plan in eighths of the year at a time, <laughs> which is six weeks at a time. It's a little awkward to say, but like plan for six weeks at a time. We always have like a on deck. We know what we're doing for the next six weeks. We have a good idea what we're doing six weeks after that. We've got a like product strategy document that we kind of, that kind of guides, you know, the business case and everything uh, for what we're doing that gets revised maybe once a year or so. We just added product managers at the same time as we added, you know, a design team um, about a year and a half ago. I was very anti-product manager for a long time, and now I can't remember why because they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> I think I was afraid that they would like take control away from me or something, or they would be out there just going, build all this other stuff that I didn't want them. No, they they just like actually make it so that you build the right things that people actually want and can use. I, I feel sheepish now when I think of how much engineering time we wasted building things that people never quite got or never really wanted to use because we didn't build them the right way. And now I'm just like, duh, lessons learned. <laughs> How, what does the hierarchy look like in terms of individual contributors, management, uh, et cetera, within, that, yeah. within those organizations? Uh, we've got three engineering managers um, and then one VP of engineering, my co-pilot, Emily Nakashima, who is amazing. She's a first time VP. She, was actually, she actually joined as an IC four years ago. She comes from the front end side and I kind of latched onto her early on because I knew she'd been a manager before and I thought she had really good judgment. And I knew, I knew that like, I just, I come from ops, man. Like I, I have never worked with product managers or designers or anything like that. I felt very stupid like, talking about front end prioritization and everything. And so like I started leaning on her very early on and she just, blossomed and grew it outperformed all my expectations you know we, we made her a manager and then she became director and and then you know there was a point where i was just like fuck man <laughs> you 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 run this show you know because she's just been phenomenal she you know there are people who i feel like just kind of get consistently under appreciated in tech you know often they're, they're not the loudest in the room or they're not m much in self-promoting or whatever but they're just quali quietly like fucking amazing and and you know emily is just one of those people who i think you know she was always kind of under appreciate undervalued and but you give her a little bit of responsibility and she knocks it out of the park and you give her a little bit more and she knocks it out of the park and now she's running the show and i i couldn't be happier awesome <laughs> in addition to that like so that's the engineering side yep. right and then we've got vp of product again you know i think she was undervalued underappreciated she's 
just knocked it out of the park. She's amazing. Um, and she has, you know, three or four product managers who report to her. And we've got a design director um, who has, you know, six ish designers who report to her. And they, they all roll they roll up to me. Well, the designers roll up to Megan and then Megan and Emily roll up to me. So, cause I, I swear I spend more of my time on marketing than engineering these days, but that's how it is. Yeah. What are the newer features that stand out in your mind that have evolved from that initial system? Uh, what have you added that you're most proud of in, in the stack and, and product that Honeycomb mm-hmm. is now offering? Yeah. Like so, some of the stuff that I've, I'm proudest of, I mean, some of the stuff from the very beginning, the fact that we never expire your, your query links, this is something that's missing from so many products that is just mind blowing to me. Like, so like, you know, when you run a Grafana link query or something, and then you get a result and you put it in a Jira ticket or something, and then within a couple of weeks, the data ages out and it's gone for good, you know, so you end up like passing around screenshots and links together, you know, in chat and everything. And it's just like that. Now, any Honeycomb link that gets generated, like it's kept as an S3 file, right? So you can publish, you can click on that query and jump into the query browser and, and iterate on it, but like it never goes away. And that's something that's just, just so basic, but it blows people's mind all the time. And I really like it. A- another of those, those things that I kind of forget about sometimes because it's so automatic to me is just the speed. Our 95th percentile query is like under a second, which, which is very important because from my perspective, like when you're debugging, you're in a state of flow and, and you, you don't want anything that's like, well, I'm going to go issue a query and then I'm going to go get coffee because, you know, like that's just going to break your state of flow. And, and it really needs to be just like, what about this and this and this and this and this and this as fast as possible. So those are two really basic things that I'm, I'm pretty proud of. And, and again, we couldn't do that without the custom storage engine like at all. More recently, like the stuff that we're, we're going to be releasing at Olicon is we're actually um, shipping our own version of metrics. And this is, I have been shitting on metrics for years now. And so I, I want to be perfectly clear about why we're doing this. It's a bridge to the past, right? Like, Everybody out there has got 20 years of like accumulated metrics garbage, you know, and metrics are, are cheap and everything. So they, they've just kind of been the only game in town for so long. But, you know, from my perspective, there's, there's this real, there, there's, a, there's a divide between what you need from monitoring, and what you need for observability. What you need from monitoring is like, from the perspective of the service, is it healthy? Right. You, so you need, you know, you need these aggregates. You need to know if, if you need to like provision more or capacity planning and all this stuff. But it doesn't tell you jack shit about your user's experience, right? And if you're, if you're someone who's writing and shipping code, what you care about is every single user's unique individual experience, which means like, users are the highest cardinality value of all, right? And, 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 you, and you need it to reflect, you know, from their perspective. You don't care if the service is up or not. You care about can the request complete in a reasonable time or not, right? Latency is, is, is death too, right? Like it doesn't matter if it's too slow. Um, so... I think that like the metrics that you need as a software engineer who's writing shipping code are, you need to know if you just made a change, did the memory usage triple? <laughs> did the CPU suddenly spike, right? You care about this at this very basic, and you need to be able to like correlate it, not by visually going, well, this is about the same time at this tool as it is in this tool. You know, usually people are like looking at their dashboard for a spike, and then they jump over to their logs and try and correlate. Well, this is around the same time, so that's probably the same thing, mm-hmm. right? Uh, maybe <laughs> it's really not good enough if, if you know because these things can diverge and clock skew and all this stuff so i'm really excited to be shipping like a metrics thing that i think will help people map their past the way that they they're used to seeing the world work and, and dealing with things on to sort of the futuristic thing users who haven't used honeycomb are typically like but what about my metrics we can't buy something that doesn't have metrics and people who've been using honeycomb for a couple months are just like what metrics <laughs> you know but we have to like give them something to get them there um, so I'm really excited about that. And is it still primarily Go-based microservices with React on the front mm-hmm. end? Yeah, we also have integrations. You know, we're big into Otel. Open Telemetry is kind of a game changer for everyone. Otel should be amazing for users because if you instrumented your code, like there, it, it removes the whole thing of having to re-instrument every time you shift providers, which is too heavy of a cost to bear, right? Like nobody's going, nobody wants to do that. But if you instrument it with Otel, you can basically just flip the switch and try this provider, try that provider, try this one, which I think is great because it makes all the providers compete on actually delivering value to you instead of just like being too tricky to transition off of. <laughs> yeah, but with the Otel, like we've got everything from Java and JavaScript to, you know, there's, there's some customer supported ones that are like Erlang and 
and all this stuff, but it's all trending in the direction of hotel compatible stuff. Uh, are there any additional lessons learned that you would like to share from building either Honeycomb or your time at Parson Facebook that we haven't covered yet? I think I, I would like to touch on um, the interview process, the recruiting and interviewing process. I think that it is something that's so magnificently broken in our industry and you can get a long way by just being willing to make different mistakes. <laughs> you know, there are so many amazing, well-qualified engineers and, and people out there who haven't worked at Google's bang companies, you know, and have no interest in working out at them, who couldn't pass those interviews and who are fantastic, right? And, and just like, I feel like there's this cargo culting that's very unfortunate that happens in our industry. And it's just like, well, if they haven't worked at these, then they aren't, you know, and it's, it's stupid. I also feel like, you know, there are so many people who would love to work at startups if you make it clear that you're not going to expect them to overwork themselves just work themselves to death, that it can be compatible with parenthood and adulthood. Christine and I know that we overwork. We know that we're workaholics. And so the first two people that we hired were two guys who, who had young babies, you know, baby girls, and they wanted to be out, out of the office every day at 4 p.m. to spend time with their families. And we felt like it was really important to show that we valued that in our employees. You know, the early employees that you have, for better or for worse, you have to pay very close attention to the example that they set, because if you are fortunate enough to, to live, to, to succeed, everyone will assume that that's, that's, that is at least acceptable behavior. If not, that is desired behavior that they should all be emulating, right? And so like Jack Assery is extra unacceptable there. You really want them to just be like total teddy bears who are sweethearts, who, who exemplify the values that you really you know want the rest of your company to have. I also feel like the overworking thing at startups is so played out. Like nobody does their best work or has their best ideas when they're putting in 16, 18 hour days. You know, like I feel like no one, honestly, as an engineer, you've got four hours a day in you every day where you can really move, push the envelope forward, where, you, where you're all in, where you're all in. And, and just making sure that you get those even three, three, four hours a day, day after day after day. That's how progress gets measured, not 12 hour days, not 15 hour days, you know, you're going to have great ideas. When I was, I was CEO for the first three, three and a half years. And I realized that what my team needed from me more than anything was for me to get in my walks every day to just like be walking around for an hour or two a day thinking and trying to keep my, my eye on the big picture, right? Not pushing emails and, and, you know, just doing little things and because that's not actually what makes you succeed. Companies do not succeed or fail by and large by because, you know, they made the wrong technical decisions or because, or, you know, it, it's generally because, you know, they, they couldn't keep their eye on the ball. They didn't just make that measurable small amount of progress day after day in the right direction. I think that is great advice for people thinking about starting their own companies in terms of setting that company culture early on and, and thinking deliberately and intentionally about those first hires and, and how that culture evolves. And like we don't, when we interview for engineers, like the, we, ask, we have a coding take home that we give people the night before, but the real interview is, is the next day when they talk it through with a couple of engineers, you know, it's about the code review. It's about, I, I believe anyone who can talk through the trade-offs they made, the, what was in their head, what they were thinking about, what's left to do, they can do the work, right? The reverse is not necessarily true, right? Plenty of people can spit out code that looks fine, um, but when you ask to talk about it with them, they can't articulate it. And and my personal theory about what makes high-performing teams has a lot to do with communication, humility, being able to talk through what you're doing, compare it to other people's perspectives, and just make, you know, and just improve that way as a team. What else is involved in the interview process at Honeycomb beyond the the take-home and the on-site? What, what leads into that or in the earlier portions of it? Yeah, so... You know, we, we'll, there's a there's a basic screen, you know, that managers will do before bringing people on for on sites. Um, and then, you know, there is a like a systems question where, you know, we were just like, let's draw it, let's talk through an architecture systems question. Um, there's always one session that's just about values and, and just like, you know, we try to have it be by a non-technical person, you know, and then talking with the founder. Product folks, there's also a session that they do with, with designers where they just like talk through like, you know, iterating, iterating on a product design or UI, UX, something like that. It's it, it, it's evolved a lot over over the years, and, and I really like our process now. I think that so after 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 the interview, like everyone puts their feedback into the into the tool into Lever, and then we have a synchronous you know 15 minute chat about 
in our policy is everyone's supposed to give a number between from one to four. One is absolutely not. Four is would champion. And we won't hire somebody that gets all twos and threes, right? Someone has to be like, I want to work with this person. I will champion this person. I want them on my team. And we will typically not hire anyone that gets gets a one because it's pretty rare that you get a one. Usually it's just like if they were rude to the person who's like, you know, setting up the appointments or, or something or somebody gets a really bad vibe on, off of them. But, you know, I, and that, that seems to work pretty well. It does. Awesome. And then any final advice for maybe a new CTO starting out a company? Don't do Don't it. Do Don't it. start a fucking company. It's the worst job in the world. It's the worst thing. It's, it's you know, I, <laughs> I, this is my one and only. I will never do this again. It, it, you know, you say that you can keep work-life boundaries. You, you say that you can have it not yet. And you can't. You're responsible for these people now. You know, it's, it's um, I don't know. I it's plenty of people seem to do it and, and have it work out just fine, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's okay now, but the first three, four years were rough. It was rough. If you're lucky enough to have it succeed, that can be the hardest thing. <laughs> Definitely. And so if people want to learn more about Honeycomb and the engineering that we've talked about today, what, where should they go? What should they do? Honeycomb.io, on that cheery note. Uh, you can go to slash sign up if you're interested. We have a really generous free tier. There are plenty of people out there who have just like instrumented their entire like build pipeline so they can see where the tests, where the time is going on their tests and stuff. You can do that in an hour or so in the free tier. And it's super cool. Like if you're trying to, you know, drive down the amount of time between when you write the code and when it, when it's going live in your CI CD pipeline, there's also honeycomb.io slash play where you can just go play around with the product a little. Cool. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining me today, Charity, and sharing those insights and the, the history and the story of Honeycomb. I've learned a lot, and I believe the audience will too. Thank you. Thanks for having yeah, me. Thanks so much. Mm -hmm.